What is up YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance Crew, and you're watching DaVinci Reacts. Today we're going to be continuing with the Suleiman, the Magnificent uh, Extra Credit videos. This is number four. Uh, I've already done the last three episodes in this little mini-series, so if you want to check those out, you can search the channel, or you can... Well, I don't think I'm going to have like a link or anything in this specific video. Just go to my channel and type in Suleiman. It'll pop up. Or type in extra credit, extra history. You'll see them. Um, now, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into this. But before I do, I just want to do one quick announcement. Um, I will have a link for extra credits channel at the end of this video. So if you want to check out their channel and see more stuff that they're offering, uh, they have a ton of videos about uh, um, historical moments or historical figures, things like that. Things that would... I would, I, things I thought were obscure, things I wouldn't have expected them to make a video about. Go to their video, uh, their channel, look and see if there's any particular thing that jumps out to you. I'm willing to guarantee there's at least one thing they've done that jumps out to you. And watch their videos. Also, be sure to watch the original video before you watch the reaction. That way you can give the original content creator some support. And they can continue to make these types of videos uh, by getting paid for it. So, <laughs> if you want to show them support, best way you can do it is to watch their videos. Now, with that being said, let's jump into this. As he watched the guard change stations, he remembered that victory on the Mohawk's plane and why it had been important for another reason. Just before he'd gone on campaign, an envoy had arrived at his court. Wait a minute. <laughs> it's funny because I, I didn't really like pay attention to this until just now, but it's like... Suleiman would be just looking at random shit and then it'll remind him of something that happened in his past. Suleiman was waiting in line at Subway and that reminded him of his victory in the meta. Like, like how the hell these random ass things reminded you of like just obscure other shit. <laughs> Changing of the guard reminded me of this battle I had. Like, okay, uh, yeah, sure, Suleiman. Important for another reason. <laughs> just before he'd gone on campaign, an envoy had arrived at his court from the Queen Mother of France. The envoy had dropped to a knee before him and begged him to attack Charles, that Spanish prince, so that he would release her prince, the King of France, who Charles had captured in one of their wars over Italy. This had pleased Suleiman. He had already planned his campaign toward the Mohawks. He would fulfill this request without actually changing plans. But there was more than that. This was his road into the circles of European diplomacy. His predecessors had only ever been adversaries to the European world, but he knew that if he was ever to have his European empire, he would need allies there, and this was his route to them. But the next major envoy to him after the Battle of Mohawks was not one of friendship. It was from Ferdinand, that other Habsburg who Charles had given his Austrian lands to so that he could concentrate on his Spanish holdings. As soon as Ottoman forces had pulled back from Hungary, Ferdinand had swept in. The envoys were there to assert Ferdinand's claim to the region, they were masked as overtures of peace, but the discussion was a disaster. The Habsburg envoys asked for all the fortified parts of Hungary to be handed over in exchange for peace, and Ibrahim responded, why not ask for Istanbul as well? It wasn't really going well. <laughs> Needless to say, no agreement was reached, and shortly thereafter, Ferdinand declared himself King of Hungary, while the Hungarians themselves elected a local noble named John Sapodia to be their king. Suleiman would have to head back to Hungary to reestablish control. This time, there would be no stopping. He would head all the way to Vienna, that great Habsburg stronghold in the east. He once again raised the horsetail banners and summoned the endless legions of his empire. A hundred thousand strong, they would march back into Europe. He would serve as a supreme commander with Ibrahim at his side. On the 10th of May, 1592, they departed for their grand campaign. But again, weather plagued them. Rain poured unceasingly. His camels faltered, his men fell ill, his great cannon would get mired in the road, and even with hundreds of men and dozens of beasts trying to move them, in the end they had to be abandoned. It wasn't until the 18th of August that he once again reached the Mohawk's Plain, where he was met by the upstart Prince Zapolia. But here, at least, things began well. Zapolia paid him homage and joined his forces to that of the Empire, helping to retake nearby fortresses. He was glad to accept the suzerainty of Suleiman for help against Ferdinand. The ambassador for the King of France had also arrived with 40,000 crowns to support Zapolia in his attempt to wrest Hungary from the Habsburgs. Together they all traveled to Buda, which Ferdinand had occupied in the absence of Ottoman forces. The siege lasted only six days. The Janissaries carried the town by storm. 
Suleiman forbade the town from being sacked, as the Hungarians were now his subjects, but that didn't stop his men from taking many slaves. And though they mostly left the Hungarians alone, it didn't prevent them from separating as many Austrian heads as they could from... Oof, <laughs> there we go. You guys told me that uh, a lot of these videos like brush over some of the harder stuff because that's not necessarily the focus of the video. But um, yeah, slaves and beheadings. <laughs> I'm not trying to hold them to modern standards, obviously. They're like old school em emperors, sultans, and kings. So it's like, I'm willing to guarantee in order to get that type of position, you already need a bit of an ego. Left the Hungarians alone, it didn't prevent them from separating as many Austrian heads as they could from their Austrian necks. Soon, Zapolio was installed as ruler there, and Suleiman's men could march for their real objective. Vienna, the seat of Ferdinand himself. By the 27th of September, they reached the walls of the Habsburg town. Within stood 20,000 defenders against his more than 100,000 men under arms. The 72 Habsburg cannon would have to match against his 300. Even Ferdinand had abandoned his capital and fled to Bohemia. Victory looked inevitable. This time, though, the Ottoman threat was all too real for the rest of the Holy Roman Empire to ignore. Charles had sent skilled mercenaries to aid his brother, and even the Protestants were willing to make common cause with their Catholic foes to hold off the Muslim Turks. And the rains had cost him. The Austrians had taken the time to prepare the capital for war. The stores were replenished, the walls were repaired and restored. Even the houses outside the walls had been demolished to keep them from being of use to the besieging army. The gates were blocked, and firefighting supplies had been prepared. There would be no immediate surrender to the overwhelming army of the port. It would be a contest of will and arms. And the cannons began to sing. He watched from his tent on the hill as his men assailed the walls in waves, the thousand different costumes of the different ranks making a glorious display against the cold stone of the Viennese walls. Waves would crash and break against that gray that shore, make a great always so close to overwhelming the Austrian land, only to pull back out to sea again. Sappers mined the walls, a foolish sortie was broken, and the heads of the reckless Austrians were displayed before the very gates to let them know of the fate that awaited them, Fans to remind heads. them of the hopelessness of their stand. He promised his men great rewards for assaulting the town, with a king's ransom for the first man to get over the wall. And on the 14th of October, his men assailed the walls with the fury of men possessed. They threw themselves upon a breach made by his sappers, carving through the defenders with their vicious curved blades. Inch by inch, they hewed their way forward, nearing the crest of the breach. Then, collapse. The very flower of the Turkish infantry had broken upon the rocks of Vienna, Oof. and it began to snow. Suleiman knew it was the end. He paid his men as if it had been a victory, and gave his commanders all victory gifts. He had it proclaimed that he had merely wished to meet Charles and Ferdinand in battle, and that it had never been his intention to capture Vienna, so to spare both his men and the Austrians the privations of a siege he would happily withdraw. But in his heart of hearts, he knew this would be the farthest they would ever go. Not just him or his army, but his empire. He could feel it in his bones. To the world and to himself, he smiled and laughed off this one minor setback to the power of the greatest nation in the world. But deep within, he could feel an end surrounding him. Now I'm wondering. Nowadays, it would make sense why a smaller force is able to take out a larger force because there are weapons allow you to do different things. Like back in the day, the only real way to really kill someone was up close and personal. So you didn't necessarily have some of the more modern types of fighting. I mean, I, I guess you could still have guerrilla warfare if you set traps and stuff, but... Nowadays, it seems like it's much more prominent. Whereas back then, I don't understand how a group of 100,000 could lose to a group of 30,000. I mean, I, I get they're fortified and things like that, but they are just in one area. I don't, I don't really understand how he, he was able to lose that fight. Or anything, when you talk about like older wars where one really large group lost to a smaller group. Uh, now this could just be me not knowing a lot about war tactics or, you know, and things like that. And I will admit that I, I don't necessarily know. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> if you have a good idea, go in the comment section and enlighten me because I don't know. And I would like to know.
Like, what exactly was the strategy that was used in this particular battle that led to him losing? Because I imagine it's more than just, I threw my men at their men, but their men somehow came out on top. In the snowy fields of Vienna. As they withdrew, at Buda, Zapolya kissed his ring and congratulated him on a successful campaign. But the entire way, the Austrians harassed his retreating columns, and the weather was cruel company, slowing their march, bringing frostbite and disease. But even as his men fell, his mind was on another sort of ending. For generations, it had been the law of the empire that, upon ascension of a new sultan, all of the sultan's brothers who yet lived would be put to death to prevent civil war. Were he to die, his sons would have to fight for the throne. The lives of those who lost would be forfeit, even if they survived the struggle. He loved his sons too much, even Mustafa, with whom he struggled at times, to allow that to happen. And what of his love, Roxelana? His heart ached at the thought of her bereft of her sons, but he knew they would lose. Mustafa was his eldest, born to his first wife. He was loved by the people and the army. He was also the most able of his children. He was the clear choice for the future of the empire, but his rise would mean the murder of the children of the one Suleiman I love the loved children the most. With the <laughs> On the long road to Istanbul, Suleiman could find no solution. He could only feel the vice of his choice closing around him. He could feel the salt trace down his cheek in the warm breeze that blew over the Bosphorus. How had he let it all go so wrong? He knew as he walked the palace grounds that in the thoughts of the past he would not find peace. And yet, what else was left to an old man? He wondered if that Roman emperor ever shared such thoughts near the end. What he wouldn't give to talk to a man who might understand. But they were all dead now, and he was alone. And even that thought brought other memories. Interesting. I guess that's like, you hear a lot, you hear that a lot with famous people, right? Like, even though you're so popular and all these people want to be around you and things like that, you're lonely because there's not really too many people outside of there's not really too many people that you can talk to that understand exactly what you're going through like all these people around you but you have nothing in common with anybody they don't understand what it's like to be you or to go through what you go through and you hear that a lot with um like rich people and stuff they say that like money uh, brings its own set of problems and some of the people that like are poor we might say like well how the hell do you are you sad when you're filthy rich and you can buy anything you want and uh things like that i don't understand it but then it's like when you think about it being rich has its own set of problems like the people around you change like when you have like if you think about like uh lottery winners you might have you might think the people around you are caring and loving and they might be but then the second you get a ton of money stuff changes not just the person that gets the money might change but the people around them might change people that you thought were family that you thought cared about you are more likely to throw you under the bus for a quick paycheck um people that you trusted might go behind your back to try to uh, get one over on you because they want to be where you are. There's like there's a lot of it's not just money, it's fame also. Like people want to be where you're at, and in order to like the the people around you have to be, they have to understand that they might not be able to get to that position, and they have to be okay with that. In order for for a uh, rich or famous person to really be trusting with somebody else but the thing is a lot of people aren't like that and they will they'll say they are and they might think they are but once the but once the money involved gets to a certain point it gets to like to a certain a point where it's like okay this is life-changing money like you get this much you will never have to struggle again as far as money is concerned once that type of uh risk or reward is is on the table people change All right so i can kind of get where he's coming from not like i'm in that same position but i've seen enough or i've heard enough famous people talk about it so it's like okay i kind of get it he wants to like he wants someone that's on the same level as him somebody else that was an emperor or somebody that was a king or something he can talk to that way like he can 
let out his grievances and things like that. And other person can be like, hmm, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because right now he has nobody to talk to that's like that. And it's kind of sad. But with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share. I would like to hear more details about that battle. Because, um... Yeah, I would like to know what the strategy and stuff was. Like, I'm imagining he didn't lose all of his men because they obviously retreated. So it's like, how many men did he lose before he had he decided to turn tail and go away, or and leave? And if it if he did lose a certain amount, was that normal? Like, I know there are some people that are like butchers that'll just throw wave after wave of men into a battle and just have them all get wiped out, and they'll keep doing it until like the very last person. Whereas he seems like he's more of like a benevolent leader. So it's like, okay, he doesn't want to see all the deaths. So once it hits a certain percentage, he decides to retreat. But is that normal? Like for another leader that might not be as benevolent, but also isn't like a uh, this bloodthirsty warmonger, would they have retreated at the same number? Like if you have 300, you're going up against, or if you have 100,000, you're going up against 30,000. When you hit maybe 60,000, when you only got 60,000 left, is that when you decide, okay, we've had enough, too many people died? Or do you wait till it's more? Like, you, if you understand what I'm talking about, go to the comment section and let me know. Now, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up. I am Devon Da Vinci. Hopefully, you've been a little more enlightened. I look forward to seeing you guys on the next video. And until then, I'm going to give you the deuces. And oh, before I go, <laughs> today I also will have. Uh, uh, TV show reaction popping up on my Patreon. If you don't know, I have a Patreon. It has exclusive reactions. Uh, it's only a dollar a month. You can sign up. There's a link to it in the description box down below. Um, the videos there are DaVinci Watch videos. I can't do regular reaction videos uh, because I do reactions to TV shows and movies. And obviously, I can't have the movie or the TV show just on the screen but on, on Patreon. So... Um, just go in understanding that. But if you do want to see exclusive content from me, that's where you would check it out. Today I have a new episode of The Office, the UK version. I believe it is season two, episode two. I'm going to be doing a reaction to today. And uh, you will get access to that by signing up on my Patreon. So if you want to do that, again, the link is down below. Feel free to join. I look forward to seeing you guys there. Now, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and end this. So I'm Devon Da Vinci. I'm going to give you the deuces. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I don't know if I said that. And I'm signing out. So until then, deuces.